just feel that when it gets really quiet. Um, I knew a man who called it the holy hush. The king is in the room. (laughs) Mm, What an honor and what a privilege it is this morning to come together and worship him. Wait on the Lord. Again, I say wait. But those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will not, they will walk and not grow weary and they will run and not faint. <laughs> mm, sorry, everyone. I'm just. We're here to worship Jesus this morning. He's worthy of our praise. He is powerful and mighty, majestic and beautiful, the God man with holes in his hands. Dazzling in his radiance, softening, quieting with his transforming presence. It's Jesus rewarding us for our obedience, forgiving us our trespasses, and strengthening us in our weakness. Worthy of all praise, all the glory, all the honor. Dominion and power belong to his mighty name. Hallelujah to you. King of kings. Can I read some scripture to you this morning? As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. (laughs) Hallelujah, Jesus. You are mighty, mighty, mighty and worthy of all praise. Mm, We worship you in this place this morning. And so I'm going to read a psalm as well. And I just encourage us this morning not to let the rocks cry out. Whatever, whatever that looks like to you, to call to mind all the mighty works that he's done. Maybe all you can think of this morning is your salvation. What greater gift is there? What more do we need? But he's so good that he gives and he gives and he gives and he gives because that's its nature. That's his nature. He's a good, good father. He's the father of lights. Mm. From whom every good gift streams down from above. Praise you. 
So this is Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. (laughs) Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Think about that. What might that mean? (laughs) Hallelujah. Wow. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created, and he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. We love you in this place this morning, Lord, and you are worthy of our praise. And so we come this morning and we give you a sacrifice of praise, Jesus. We put praise on our lips as ones who know your name who know your mighty deeds, all the things that you have done. From beginning to end, there is none like you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
believe the spirit is leading to communion right now and he placed it on my heart that that's what we were going to do and then everyone just started coming up and so he didn't want to wait for me to go up but uh, if you haven't come and gotten the elements come and get the elements and we'll take communion to just hold on to it for a sec as soon as we're done worshiping come up and lead everyone in communion God placed on my heart today is that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it I feel like there's victory in the house today I feel like there's redemption in the house today I feel like there's restoration in the house today I feel like there's freedom in the house today and so yeah, I felt like we were supposed to do communion. And I didn't get an opportunity to do this last week. Uh, I meant to. But uh, as we take it, personalize this. It's Jesus's, the way I, I see it, it's, it's a marriage. And this is Jesus saying, I do. And it never changes. That's why his last word was, it is finished. It's finished. My love has been poured out. This is how we get in the river. We can either stay on dry land or we can come and get in the river and we can give him our I do. We can say all of you, Jesus, for all of me. And so we just look at his broken body. He says, as often as you do this, remember, renew, my vows to you whenever you want. Whenever you want, I say I do. And so we come, Jesus, to say we do. We come to say I do. We come to say I surrender all that I have because you've surrendered all that you have, Jesus. And so we take his body, his broken body, 
And you don't have to do this right now. I feel like this is so supposed to be so personal that as we move back into worship, you talk to him. You tell him how much you love him. You tell him how thankful you are for him. You receive all of his body. You receive all of his blood. You receive everything that he paid for, everything that he poured out. He didn't care what it looked like. He didn't care the cost because you were worth it. And you receive that deep into your heart. And then you say your I do back. And you give him everything that you are in this moment as his grace will allow. As his grace will allow. So we're going to head back into worship and just, just receive all that he has for you. In Jesus' name, amen.
love you, Jesus. We've come for you, Jesus. We've come to see you. We've come to adore you. We've come to worship you. We've come to say yes. We've come to be your bride. We thank you that while yet we were still sinners, you died for us because you knew our value. You saw our potential. You saw what we were created for. You saw the beauty and the masterpiece being molded in your Father's hands. We thank you that our value and our identity is not based on anything we've done, but on everything that you did. And that will never be changed. That can never be shaken. We are yours. We are yours. You say, come to me, follow me, live inside of me. And we just say, yes. We say, yes, more of you. Transform us, Jesus, to look just like you so that we can love just like you. We thank you, Jesus. You are enough. Only you satisfy. You and you alone satisfy. We thank you that you're restoring marriages in this house. In Jesus' name. We thank you that you're restoring souls in this house. In Jesus' name. That we are being made whole right now. And that you're guarding our hearts and our minds. You're protecting us. You're our, you're our refuge, our strong tower, and we can run to you. And just cry out your name and be filled with your strength, be filled with your love. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your presence, your presence, your precious presence. I thank you that you come and you live in this place, that this is your house, that this is your altar. We thank you, Lord. We receive everything. We receive everything. Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. So before we move on to uh, praying for the kids, we're going to have a brother Slavic come up and give us a uh, an amazing testimony of encouragement and uh, let's do it again. And then Slavic will pray for the children. I just want to share an amazing testimony that I just will encourage people here today. Um, so Anna has a brother, uh, his name is Ivan, and at uh, a point of his time, his family, his family broke apart, and uh, like he relapsed into drugs and everything like that, and uh, it was just, he almost, he became homeless. So I was in Portland, I was working, and I was staying at my mom's house. And throughout the year, we, we were praying and fasting on a regular basis for him and his family. And that night on Monday, uh, mom and I, we just, it was late already. It was like 9 o'clock. We're like, let's just pray. We pray for a few minutes. We're like, Lord, just those that are lost, bring them home. Just bring them home. That same night, 
I'm, I'm sleeping. That's where I stay at my mother-in-law's house. And she's like, Sly, could you move your truck? It was like one in the morning. I'm like, why? She lives in an apartment. So she takes my key. She moves the truck forward. Apparently, Ivan came home, came on a bicycle with the trailer. And he's sleeping that next day. I went to work and everything like that, and I came back. And apparently, something ruptured in his side, like an organ. And he was sitting there. He couldn't even eat. He's like, uh, this is a, like literally, he's like this the whole time. Uh, uh, and I'm trying to talk to him. I'm like, so Anna's sisters, they're like, could you, could you pray for us? younger sisters and I'm like I'll pray for you guys I'm gonna shower and I'll come back so he's sitting there trying to eat and I'm like Ivan do you want to go to the hospital or you want the power of the Holy Spirit to heal you tonight and he's like I don't want to go to the hospital you know he got skinny and everything like that and so we start praying I lay hands on each sister pray for them pray for the mom and so I'd come up to him and I'm he's sitting there by the kitchen table and I take, I lead him through a renouncement prayer. He rededicates his life. And then just, I lay hands on him. I rebuke that pain. The power of God hit him so strong that his organ gets healed. Something that ruptured inside instantly gets healed. <laughs> so good. And then uh, he had like back pain, chronicle, everything. The Spirit of God heals him that. And when he got up, his face changed. Like darkness just... You know what I got to say is just the Spirit of God. When you pray and you fast, this is an encouragement for some. Don't stop in praying for your family, those that are lost. Because then it will be a suddenly God will heal, deliver, bring somebody back home. And I just pray. I want to invite all the kids forward. I just want to pray. I, was, I just want to begin praying. Kids, why don't you come forward? I just want to pray specifically for them for today. And I want to pray. You know how much we see like drug overdoses and everything like that these days? And we see so much people just dying from like overdoses. And I'm going to pray for all the kids right now. And I'm going to pray for people that family members that are bound in drugs and addictions. And we're going to pray so none of these kids will ever touch any of that demonic substance in Jesus' name. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, by your spirit, Lord. We speak protection upon our children. All these kids here right now, they'll never touch any of the drugs, any influence of the devil right now in the name of Jesus. None of these children will have any influence. They will not have any desire for drugs and alcohol in the name of Jesus. I speak by the blood of Jesus and protection of the Spirit of God upon all of these children, Father. I speak your love to rest upon all of these children, God. I speak by the precious blood of Jesus. Keep them safe, Father. Keep them pure, Father. Let them be evangelists, preachers, leaders, teachers, God. Speaking life to people. Delivering people that are bound in drugs and alcohol, God. And they will be speaking deliverance upon those in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you, God. And I pray for every single person here that is in the need that's praying for a family member praying for a son a daughter God that's in addictions we pray by the precious blood of Jesus bring them home bring them home God in the name of Jesus God I thank you I, th I worship your name Jesus I, I lift you up God I thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you thank you I guess we could take a few minute break now. <laughs> you guys chill, you can go back to the classrooms now. We can take a few minute break, everybody. Greet each other. Just speak warm welcome to one another. Amen, amen. Good morning, family. So happy to have you all here today. Lots of smiling faces. For those of you who were out of town last week, I hope you got lots of rest and uh, you're back 
refreshed, recharged. Speaking of refreshed and recharged, you may have noticed that our pastors have not been here. They are away getting refreshed and recharged. Yes, yes. They're on a little family vacation. They should be back next week. Um, but just pray for them. If they come to your thoughts, bless them and help encourage, lift up, and edify the body. Because without them being strong, I'm not saying they're not, but without them being strong as leaders, you know, it, it helps us. So, so bless them. So if this is your first time here, we're excited to have you. If you could just raise your hand. Yes, over here. Welcome, welcome to the family. You already have family members here, but we welcome you to the family. Um, inside there are some little goodies. If you could fill um, out the little card in there, enjoy the goodies. Uh, we would like to get to know you a little bit more and uh, know how we can pray for you. Uh, that would be wonderful. So welcome. Hope you enjoyed worship. I was talking to some ladies Ladies, ladies in the bathroom, we always talk, okay? So anyway, so I, was, I don't have to be private about it. I was talking to some ladies in the bathroom and uh, just talking about worship and just how we can enjoy. But sometimes, you know, we just have to, we have to get out of the way. You know, we've got to get out of ourselves. So it's good that we don't sing three songs, stand up, sit down, sing one more song, and then we're done. No, we get to envelop ourselves in the presence of God. Give us time to get out of the way to let the king in. So anyway, thank you, um, Francesca and Andrew and Jared and William and our media team, Michael. Everybody who makes this possible, we are just um, thank you. Thank you so much. If you guys want to be a part of that team, go uh, hook up with somebody at the booth at the back after service. That would be great because we do need your help. Even though it was fantastic today, many hands make light work. So, Okay, on to announcements. Um, June 16th, we're really excited about that for, for children. We love having our kids in here during worship, and you are welcome to keep your children in here during worship, but we're going to start offering worship for the children. So get them, you know, get them. We've got some tambourines and we've got some fun things and the teachers are going to lead them in their own worship service downstairs starting in two weeks on June 16th. So you'll be able to check your kids in before service uh, at 1020. We'll, we'll give you some more details just before. But um, so that is coming up. But if you would like to keep your children in here, um, you're still welcome to do that as well. So that's coming up June 16th. Also in June, let's just stay on the mommy topic. Um, we have a mom's group starting in June. The first uh, date is the 9th? No, excuse me. Second Friday of June. There's, there's little cards downstairs, little pink cards if you do have children. Or you can talk to um, Audrey and she can connect with you. So that's a fun way to connect with other moms here. So throughout the week we have um, Sunday morning, 9.30, we have pre-service prayer. Um, that is downstairs. We have hot coffee all brewed and ready to go and you can go down and spend some time in prayer with some amazing prayer warriors here at the church. If you miss that, then Monday we have prayer here upstairs at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, we like to pray around here, just in case you didn't know that. So lots of opportunities to pray. Monday morning, 10 o'clock. Um, and then Wednesday night is our family night. We have uh, men's and women's prayer again. Uh, we, we all get together and we uh, worship a little bit up here together. And then we split off men's and women's. And then we also have um, youth and children available downstairs. So bring your family. Come spend some time in his presence. You will not be... Um, you won't be sad that you did. Uh, let's see. All these things are on the Church Center app. If you do not have that, there's a, they'll put a QR code up here. You can snap a picture of that, or you can just go to your uh, app store, wherever you get your apps, download the Church Center app, and um, put in your phone number. It's super simple. If you need help with that, you can come find me. I would be happy to help you. Um, get loaded on that and it's just it's as simple as finding zion church and putting in your phone number right linda <laughs> linda and i were playing with church center this morning so anyway um and so all of our announcements and everything are on there um so how, 
God is good. Is he good? So the Lord has been talking to me this week about basically everything we sang about. Everything that Chris has already talked about. Everything that, I mean, when you are part of a body, you know, the Lord is speaking the same thing to all of us all across the globe. However, when you are connected and part of a body, there's something special he's speaking when you're listening. And, you know, the songs, I took pictures of the songs, but just talking about surrendering. Jesus surrendered. I surrender all. And through his love, I want to read... Please forgive me here. So the, one of the last songs, um, if you gave your life to love them, so will I. Yeah. You know, that could be, we could be singing that to God. We could be singing that to Jesus. We could be singing it to ourselves, whatever. And then some of the other songs, um, I don't know. You can go back. It'll just take too much time for me to figure this out technical challenges. Anyway, so, but what the Lord put on my heart um, this week was um, for just to think about the beginning, that God so loved the world that he gave. God loved and he gave. In Romans 8, 32, it says, he did, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not freely with him give us all things? And I'm not just talking about money. I, we don't want your money. If you want to give, fantastic. I'm talking about if he gave his life to love them, so will I. We are called to freely give ourselves to him. He's not begging you. The thing is, is you're missing out. If you're not giving yourself, your time, your talents, whatever it is, if you're not giving, you're the one missing out. I was talking to a friend this last week about um, some wayward family members and just sad for them because you know what? They're missing out on a relationship with someone, the only person that can provide them hope, love, joy, peace that passes all understanding. And they're living in this turmoil and wondering why. And they come to, they come to me or my husband or you who pray and they say, can you pray for me? Because they know that they can find hope in what you have, but they won't accept what you have. So I guess my encouragement is <laughs> just give it. Give your time, your talents, your thoughts, your energy, your hopes, your dreams. Give it to him. You will not be disappointed. You will not be disappointed. So let's pray. I just thank you so much for this opportunity to gather and to worship you, to be in your presence with like-minded believers. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here. You are moving in our midst. And I thank you, Lord, that, um, that our eyes are open, our ears and our hearts receptive to all that you would do here today. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. God is good all the time. I'm going to preach a message today. It's called God Has a Plan Part Two. Because the last time I preached here, I don't know, four or five months ago, that was the title of my message. I guess I'm kind of infatuated with the plan of God. I mean, God is, he doesn't just do things haphazardly. And he doesn't have any plan Bs. Have you ever been in a service somewhere where the preacher said God had to go to plan B? Uh, there are no plan B's with God. The Bible says Jesus was crucified from the foundation of the world. Matter of fact, your names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the foundation of the world. There's no plan B. God has a plan, and he's working that plan. And I want to help you see an aspect of that plan that um, if we understand it, it will change our perspective every time we're in a situation that is not necessarily pleasant. When we feel like things are not going the way we would like them to go, uh, it's good if you have the right perspective of that. And if you see from God's perspective, then 
the big trials become small things. Matter of fact, sometimes they almost become in your mind like, okay, there's opportunity here. God's going to do something because you have the understanding of how God does things. The idea for this message was actually birthed about a month ago. We were here on a Wednesday night prayer meeting, and Pastor Laura read uh, Psalms 23. And as she was reading it, it just struck me in a way that I'd never noticed before. I mean, I, I've read the psalm, obviously, many times, but an aspect, a concept just kind of popped out of my mind. You see, in verse uh, 23, or in verse 4 and 5 of, of Psalm 23, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Now, see, there's two dynamics going on here at the same time. You're in the valley of the shadow of death. And an enemy is pursuing you. Yet God has set a table and he's entertaining you. <laughs> so this is a picture that God wants us to see about life. There are always going to be battles. There's always going to be troubles. The Bible tells us the main source of troubles are the world, the flesh, and the devil. There's always something that can distract you, that can draw you away. There's always something. But God, on the other hand, is always there. He, he doesn't leave. He's right there in the middle of the battle. When you are in your most fierce point of your battle, God is right there. He's got a table set. He wants to communicate with you. This verse is an example of uh, what I call a paradox. The Bible is full of them because they're part of God's plan. The definition of a paradox is something with seemingly contradictory qualities, phases, or understandings. So here we are, we're sitting at a table with God and we're surrounded by enemies. It kind of reminds me, remember the story of Elisha and his servant Gehazi went outside and, and freaked out because there were just armies all around them and he comes running back in to Elisha and said, Master, Master, what are we going to do? There's armies everywhere. And Elisha says, go out and look again. Yeah. So Elisha went out and looked again, and the armies were surrounded by the angels of God. <laughs> See, Elisha saw the whole picture. And that's what God wants us to learn how to do, is to see the whole picture. When you feel like the enemy's armies are surrounding you, what the devil wants you to do is forget about God's armies. He wants you to forget about the table that he has set there. And another thing that kind of makes this a little more um, prominent, I would say, is there's been such a strong uh, prosperity message in America that so many people evaluate the, the uh, level of their Christianity by how prosperous they are. And uh, that's really dangerous. And because of the things that are happening in our country right now, it's getting more dangerous. Because if you have had all of your hopes and dreams in some kind of incredible prosperity that God's going to bring into your life, you may find that things change, that our country uh, gets into a place where there's less prosperity, especially for the majority of the people. So we can't have our faith based on anything but him. Now, Whenever there's a paradox, there's tension. You know, tension is the state or act of being stretched, either physically, mentally, or emotionally, spiritually. So when you're in a situation where the enemy's on one side of you and the Lord says, hey, let's sit down at the table here, that's, there's tension in that because something's trying to pull you one way and something's trying to pull you the other way. It's always that way. And if you don't understand that, then many times people get discouraged in their walk with God because they're feeling this strong pull this way. And uh, if it persists and they put too much emphasis on it, they forget about this pull. Now, that can work well or it can work poorly. If you are forgetting about God and responding to the emphasis of the world, flesh, or the devil, then it goes bad for you. And so 
what I want us to learn how to do is to just value our life and observe what happens in our life and know that God is with us at every minute and not feel like that he's deserted us, that uh, your prayers aren't being answered, that he doesn't love you. I mean, the devil tells so many lies to people and we have to learn how to counteract those. So God has a plan. And really, the stretching, the tension, is part of God's plan. You know, there's examples in the Bible where it talks about that he uh, molds, he's like a potter, and he molds us. Tension occurs because that, that clay is getting shaped, it's getting moved, it's getting stretched into the shape that God wants it to be. And God uses all of these things that happen in life to, to stretch us, to mold us, to shape us. And he has a particular image in mind. Anybody want to venture a guess what that image is? Jesus, obviously. See, and, and of course, Jesus, uh, as we'll see in some scriptures later, he's our champion when it comes to knowing how to handle the situation where you've got God telling you one thing and the devil telling you another. Because he lived his life with tension all the time. Uh, from the time that he came on the scene. We don't know what happened between the age of 12 and the age of 30, but we know that when he turned 30, uh, which was the age of manhood in Israel, his uh, ministry would not have been respected if he tried to start sooner. Uh, and so he started, you know, he, he followed their guidelines. His ministry began when he was 30. And uh, in three and a half years, or however long it was, we see nothing but tension. We see nothing but resistance constantly, and he shows us how to just push through it, push through it, push through it, and uh, that's what we want to learn how to do as, as believers. So we want our clay to be something that is shaped into something beautiful. In, in Romans eight twenty nine, it says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This word conformed means to be fashioned into. So we're, it's back kind of like tension. It's back with the clay being shaped, being molded. So uh, he predestined, that's his plan, was from the very beginning that we would be made into the image of his son. And don't ever get distracted by, there's, there are uh, very few people that have a strange doctrine of predestination and they think there's nothing you can do. Uh, you know, you just do nothing. You're either going to be saved or not saved because God predestined you. He didn't say that God predestined us, period. It says he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, he knew in advance what he wanted to do with us. That's what he predestined, how he wanted us to look and, and how he wanted us to live and how he wanted us to become an image of his son, just like Jesus was an image of him. So God's plan is to take people uh, that he saw would be responsive to him. You know, God's eyes are constantly going throughout the earth looking for those uh, whose hearts are open towards him. And he uses you to do that because when you bump into people here and you share the gospel with them and you you preach the gospel or you share your testimony or whatever, that works to uh, draw people uh, into a place where they can begin to be shaped and molded into the image of Jesus. And that's how the, the process starts in, in a lot of cases. So uh, back when we look at Psalm 23, we see green pastures, we see a table, where our heads anointed with oil, but we're walking in the valley of the shadow of death and we're in the presence of our enemies. So just think about life today. There are pressures and tensions in life. We wake up to it every day. Some people have physical illness, and they're crying out to God, and, and it hasn't been healed yet, and they don't know why, and it's easy sometimes to get discouraged. But we have to stay faithful. We have to look at the big picture. There's relational issues in family, just like uh, Brother Slavik was praying about this morning. My wife and I pray for our son and four grandchildren that are not serving God, and they grew up in church. And, uh, you know, there's every day, every day, every day, every day, we are praying for that. Uh, but we're not looking at, we're not letting that discourage us. We're not letting it push us the wrong way. And so uh, this is what God is wanting to help us understand is how to have the right heart 
and the right understanding regardless of what, of go what is going on in your life. And, you know, when you have the world, the flesh, and the devil all working against you, uh, the devil uh, is working in the area of the spiritual, you know, trying to attack you and attach things to you, uh, addictions or uh, unforgiveness or other things like that. Uh, the world, you know, the world is, uh, it's just look at it. What is it trying to attract you to do? Uh, it's not trying to attract you to serve God or to serve the Lord Jesus. And so you have that pressure. And then your own flesh. I mean, our flesh uh, can be our enemy. And so all of these are the elements that God wants us to learn how to find Jesus in our lives in the midst of these circumstances. It's all tension uh, that we experience because we're living paradoxically in a world that is not our home and is being governed by a God with a small g. That is not our God. The Bible says our citizenship is in heaven. See, that's uh, where our heart is. You know, this tension existed in some way from the very beginning because the tension is created by the fact that you are faced with a choice. See, when, you, when you're faced with a choice, there's tension. Do I do this or do I do that? And you know, that tension existed before sin because God put Adam and Eve in a garden and said, you can eat this tree, but you can't eat that tree. So all of a sudden, there's, there's tension. It's like... And Satan used that tension to deceive Eve into eating of that tree. But the point I want you to see here is that there was something important to God from the very beginning, and that was our choices. God is very interested in our choices. Our choices really show what, uh, where we're at with him. And so everything that God does is uh, built around uh, creating opportunities for you to make the right choice. And so uh, choice becomes the number one thing that God is looking for. And why did God do it this way? Why did, why did he give us the power of choice? Well, I think, you know, I've said this a few times, and I don't want to uh, make it grow old, but if God had wanted robots, he'd have made robots in the beginning and saved himself a lot of trouble. You see, if, you, if anybody stops and really thinks about it, what would it be like if you could have a spouse that you created and you could create every response, everything would be programmed in, and that spouse would never disappoint you, would never do anything you didn't want done, uh, would do everything exactly the way you wanted it 100% of the time, <laughs> would you feel would you feel the kind of love that God wants to feel I mean would God be blessed if he would have just created a bunch of people that could not do anything but obey him you see choice creates the difference because if you make the right choice in the face of pressure then God can say this person really does love me you see, that's what God is looking for. That's what we look for. You know, we, uh, in our relationships, we want people that can make choices, but we want them to make choices that are pleasing to us, and we make choices that are pleasing to them to have a good relationship. So God wanted relationship. You know, God, God could have existed alone forever, but he didn't want that. And so that's why creation exists. It exists for God to have relationship with his own creation, and for them to begin to see and understand who he really is. And we sometimes think we're, we're getting kind of a handle on what God is like, but the scripture lets us know that there will be eternal revelation of what God is like. In other words, God could show us something new and different every day, and he could do that for eternity. God's so much bigger than our minds can understand at this time. But God didn't want to just be all that by himself. He wanted people to share that with and people to share it with one another. And so he, like I said, like we've just read in uh, Romans 8:29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed 
to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, uh, how does that work? How can Jesus be the firstborn uh, among many brethren? Well, it's talking about firstborn from the dead. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, and we're all, like the song we sang to, today about he rose from the grave, so will I, then we will all be uh, together with him. He's the firstborn from the dead, and we uh, likewise will be with him. And in Colossians 1.18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. See, that's like Chris preached such a beautiful message last week, and it was really a message about the preeminence of Christ, that God wants to exist in our lives and how uh, our focus is really on him because he is the image, the express image of the invisible God. If you, you know, it's hard sometimes to picture something invisible, but it's not as difficult to picture something physical. And you can see Jesus in your mind when you read the scripture and you see what he did and what he said and how he responded and how he gave his life. You, you can form a picture of that and you can respond to that because it's, uh, it's three-dimensional. It's not something out in space, so to speak. So in a nutshell, God presented his son as an example of what he wants us to look like and become. So this whole thing started with choice. We go down through history, a lot of people had to deal with choice, everybody did, and uh, God is creating the environment for us to understand him and follow him. And here's the verse that is really powerful, it's in Hebrews 5, 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, God even perfected his own son through suffering. Not that he had sin that had to be taken care of, but God showed the responses that please him. And Jesus was able to make those responses because he was in constant communication with the Father. He said, I don't do anything but what the Father shows me to do. And that's what God wants to do for us. He wants us to be able to communicate with him in such a way that in every situation we get into, we just turn to him and through his word, through his spirit, he will trigger something in your mind. So he learned obedience by the things he suffered. So God wanted fellowship with many people. He started the process with a man and a woman in the garden that had it all to themselves. But God did not put choice, but God did put choice in the garden. He put choice there. Why? Because without choice, God will never get what he truly desired. God wants us to make choices. That lets us know, lets him know that he, we love him. So he gave us choice. Now, Obedience is the number one response that God is looking for. I mean, if you make the right choice, that's obedience, right? Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. So God is looking for us to make the right choices. It's the true test of our love. And this was perfectly demonstrated by God's son, Jesus. Now, let's just take a little... Well, first of all, I'd like you to try to imagine. Can you think of any person that's mentioned in the Bible that didn't have any trouble, that never had a trial, that never had a test, that never faced any difficulty. I mean, I've read the Bible a lot of times, and I didn't personally read it all over again, just try to prove that one thing. But I don't remember a single thing, but I can sure remember a lot of people. Matter of fact, every person named in the Bible, uh, they had... They had some kind of test. They had a trial. They had things they had to go through. Just think about it. Think about Moses. I mean, Moses had it made from the world's perspective. I mean, he got adopted by the, the daughter of Pharaoh. He had money. He had position. He had everything. But he wasn't satisfied, so God put him in a situation where he had to make some choices. He made a couple of bad ones to start with. 
But then when he started making the right choices, God used this man so incredibly that he said, Moses said, God is going to raise up somebody like me. I mean, somebody that made the right choices in the faces of difficulty and in the face of suffering. I mean, Moses had to deal with uh, a really rebellious people. And look how God used him in all of those situations where what would we have done in that situation? You know, I, I admire him and I think he is a great example. Think about Joseph. I mean, here is a kid that his dad loves him, dotes on him, and, you know, kind of made his brothers a little irritated at him because of how he kind of favored him. But God also had something for him. God gave him a couple of dreams. And he, being young and not real wise yet, kind of spouted off some things that made his brothers even more unhappy at him. Uh, and so they uh, throw him in a pit. They're going to kill him, but uh, fortunately God knew how to solve that problem. He brought a band of, of Midianite uh, traders by, and they sold him, and he went to Egypt. And he spent 13 years in, in prison, basically, and at the age of 30. Isn't that interesting? At the age of 30, uh, God miraculously brings him out of that and puts him uh, in the palace, so to speak, and he's the, the head of the nation. So what's the point? The point is, look back at the journey. Joseph had opportunities to go the wrong way. He had opportunities because he, God was really blessing him at one point. But he had another test, and that was a test of, of sexual purity. And that's a test that is, is slaying the church today, by the way. That test is slaying the church. We have so many people that uh, are failing that test and they're going to church and thinking that somehow God doesn't notice, I guess, that somehow uh, he has changed his outlook. But uh, that's a test that, that we all have to learn how to pass. And I know it's a hard test. I failed it myself at one time. And so I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm just saying it is a test we have to learn how to, to make the right choices in. And so uh, in the midst of a great trial, Joseph became what God wanted him to become. Think of David. I mean, David is he's such a, a great kid. You know, he just watches his dad's sheep, and it's not like, Oh, great, i got to go watch my dad's sheep again. I mean, that's probably how some of us would have responded. I know when my dad would tell me, go get the cows, it's time to milk, I'd send my dog down there and get them cows. So I didn't have to walk all the way down to that pasture where they were. But the problem with that is that my dog would make them run. And it's not good to make a cow who uh, is full of milk and her udder run because... Uh, it's hard on them. It's heavy and it can damage them or they can start leaking milk and lose milk. And so I get in trouble because I didn't want to obey. But you see, uh, Joseph, I mean, David liked doing what God had asked him to do. He liked it. He would go and, and take care of those sheep. He killed a lion. He killed a bear. And then God began to point him out and picked him out. And, and, and look at the stuff he went through. I mean, here he's helping the king, and, and he's uh, delivering the king from a demon, and then the king tries to kill him, throws a spear at him. And, and God says, you're going to be the king, and he was uh, chased all over the place for years before he actually became the king. So you see how God works? He's looking at how we make choices in the midst of all the stuff that we have to deal with in life. And this stuff is not necessarily God's stuff. The world, the flesh, and the devil are over here. God is over here. And we are in the midst of all this, and God is beckoning to us to make the right choices and to understand that he hasn't deserted us just because the king throws a spear at us and tries to kill us. That's just part of the battle that exists when you have uh, evil in, on the earth. And we have to learn how to see these things in a way that doesn't discourage us. Because a lot of people that give up on God, they give up on God because they're discouraged. Because things haven't worked out the way they thought they should. Because they didn't have the right understanding that there are trials, there are tests, there are difficult times that come to people that love and serve God. And we need to learn how to get through those by the grace of God. 
Daniel is one. I just think about Daniel. You know, he's, I, I see him in my mind as like the perfect kid. You're, you're raising this kid uh, in Jerusalem, and, I mean, he uh, does everything that he's supposed to do. He follows every bit of the law. He's, you're so proud of him. He's a perfect kid. And he, along with a whole bunch of others, get hauled off to Babylon. And the thing that's interesting is, out of there were 10,000 of them that got hauled off to Babylon. And in the scriptural history that we have, only four of them resisted the temptations of that culture. And, you know, it, it's so easy. The devil can talk to you so eloquently about, well, you know, mom and dad are clear back over there in Jerusalem, you know, 800 miles away. They don't know what you're doing over here. There's no telephone, no uh, Facebook, no, no FaceTime, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, go ahead and try some of the, the king's wine and his food, and you'll enjoy it. I mean, uh, you can be sure that the devil is talking to him this way. But he got together with three buddies, and... They said, we're not going to do it. And God bless them. But see, there's always pressure. There, every great man of God had to deal with tension, the tension that forced him to make choices because God has created an environment where we have to make choices because he wants to see what choices we will make. Do we believe him? Do we believe what he wants? Do we believe that he will empower us? The Bible says nothing can, nothing has uh, overtaken us but such as common to man and God will make a way of escape. So it's not like God is allowing things to happen that are beyond our ability that we have to rely upon our own physical strength. No, all these choices we make with the strength and the help of God. But we have to learn to see it that way and not let the fact that we're in the midst of a difficult thing cause us to begin to doubt our God. Because that's what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to doubt. He, that's what he did to Eve. See, that's the main... Uh, what shall I say? It's the main sales pitch of the devil is to get you to doubt God because he got Eve to doubt God and he used the exact same arguments with Jesus in a sense. If you understand it and look at the, the temptations that he told Eve and the, what he told Jesus, he was basically the same vein. Uh, he wants you to doubt God. He wants you to doubt God. See, God's holding out on you. You're, you're missing out. Yeah, there's more for you. And uh, <clears throat> so... We have to learn how to make choices. That's so important to God. And of course, Jesus made choices every single day, every single day, every single day. He was resisted, 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 and then to the point of death. And he made the choices, the right choices, every single time. And so we have to understand that he is our example. We just read it to you. That he is our example and that... Uh, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So there, there are things that make us suffer in life. Not everything is perfect, but God is perfect, and our love for him and our relationship with him cannot be destroyed. So obedience is the number one choice that God is looking for. And it's interesting, uh, if you take a, a quick journey through the Scripture and read every verse that pertains to any end time situation where God is evaluating people and making decisions, you know, about where eternity, uh, what you're going to do for eternity. It's not because he doesn't say, well, you got baptized. You accepted the Lord and you got baptized. And uh, so, yeah, you're in. Uh, no, he, he never says that. He says things like, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me anything to drink. You see, God supplies a, a power, a, a grace of empowerment. But if you don't use it to do what he wants, then what good is it? What's the point? See, God is after a result, and he wants you to make the right choice in the midst of every situation. And so when you look at every scripture where there is a, like a little microcosm of a picture of an end-time evaluation of human beings, it's always based on what did you do with what I gave you, with the information I gave you. What did you do with the grace that I gave you? The grace to overcome. You see, grace has two parts to it. There's the grace that just forgives unconditionally. 
That's what Jesus purchased for us on the cross. Unconditional. You don't have to do one thing. Then there's a grace that empowers. We have a responsibility with the grace that empowers. Because God doesn't just pick you up by the bootstraps and say, okay, don't do this anymore. Uh, don't do this anymore. Don't take that drug anymore. Don't do, uh, you know, don't uh, be unfaithful to your wife. Don't do this. Don't do that. Whatever. He doesn't do that. See? And so we have to understand that God empowers us to make right decisions, but he won't make those decisions for us. He won't turn us into a robot that has no choice. You will always have choice until the end. Then your choice will get you a result, and after that you'll have no choice, whether your choice result is good or bad. I mean, if you end up being sent to hell, you'll have no more choices. If you end up in God's eternal kingdom, you won't need any more choices. You're going to be where you want to be, and you'll be there forever. So, think about your life. Think about how do I feel right now in my relationship with God? What, what is it that if, if something is hindering me, what is it? Is it something uh, about relational? Is it financial? Is it health? Whatever it is, is it causing you to lose focus on God and beginning to wonder if God really cares or if he's going to answer your prayer? See, the important thing is that we do not ever let any circumstance that we are in cause us to doubt God or think uh, less of him than what he should be thought of. So can you coexist with the sin and suffering that's in the world? even in your own life, by keeping your eyes focused on Jesus and keeping your desire to become like him. Because Jesus, his whole life was dealing with the resistance that he had to exert to keep sin away from him, to keep the devil away from him. Because the devil was after him constantly, using mostly the Pharisees and the Sadducees to... Uh, and, of course, uh, the Roman government. But we have to learn how to live that way without getting discouraged. Can you wake up knowing that you don't have enough money to pay the bills this week? Can you wake up and still have joy in your heart and not doubt God and not think, well, God, where are you? What are you, why are you doing this to me? I've, I've heard people say these kind of things, and most of the people that say these kind of things end up uh, giving up on God and going a different way because they feel like somehow God failed them. God never fails anybody. God does not fail. He cannot fail. That is something that is it's impossible for God to fail because of who he is, because of his nature. He cannot fail. And so... Uh, he didn't say you will never have a trial or you'll never have a test. He created choice in the beginning. He knew where it would all go because it's what he wanted to bring you out of. You're like uh, gold that has been tried in the fire. See, that's another aspect. Pure gold is made pure with heat, with, with tension, with fire. And so that's what God wants to do. And so when you get in a situation where you're in a trial... Just remember, God is purifying you. He's helping you to see things. In every trial or every test that you're in, I can guarantee you there is something that you can learn that God wants you to see in the midst of that that will help you uh, the rest of your life. Uh, just understanding this, when uh, Laura read that scripture, what hit me as I began to think about it and has been in my mind ever since it's helping me to understand that I want my responses and choices to honestly please God all the time. You know, all the time. And so, uh, and that's what God's looking for. So, Romans eight sixteen. This is the last verse I want to read. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You see, there's no 
escape hatch. If you are born into this world and you want to love and serve God, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tests. There's going to be resistance. And uh, don't look at that like it's a negative. It's not. Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. God is teaching us through the things that we suffer, and he's helping us become more like Jesus. And there's no higher goal in our walk as human beings than to become as much like Jesus as we possibly can. And that comes through making the right choices, obeying him, of course, seeking his face, reading his word, all the things that help empower us. But the bottom line is you can read the Bible every day, you can go to church every Sunday, but if you don't make the right choices, the Word and the church are not impacting you in the way that God wants them to. And so uh, I just want you to know that God has never deserted you. I don't want you to be discouraged or disheartened by the fact that you are in a trial because most people are in some kind of a trial almost every day because that's the way the world is, you know. Uh, every day my wife and I pray for my son and his four children that are not serving God. And, and I think about what it would be like if Jesus were to come before they get right with God. I mean, the, the thought of that is just, you know, it just breaks your heart. And so, but yet I don't let that discourage me in loving God. I'm not mad at God because he hasn't saved him yet because they have choice too. See, God doesn't override our choice. And so we keep praying that God will help bring circumstances and situations into their life that will turn on a light in their mind. Because the thing that gives me hope is the Apostle Paul was not doing what God wanted him to do. He was actually putting people in prison, and many of them were being sentenced to death, and he was agreeing with their death. And... Uh, you know, he was like the shining star of Judaism at that day. But God encountered him, and in a brief moment, Paul's whole perspective changed. And he was blind for three days. And then it's interesting, if you turn to Acts 9 and you read the story there, God talks to a man named Ananias. And he said, Ananias, I want you to go pray for this man named Saul, which he was called at that time. And Ananias was like, Lord, you know, this man is causing people to be killed and thrown in prison and all kinds of stuff. But he said, if it's what you want, I'll do it. You know, see, there he made the right choice. But listen to this. He said, I want you to go tell Saul what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. What an introduction to ministry. <laughs> I mean, it's not like he went and told him, I'm going to use you. You're going to write half the New Testament. You're going to preach in all these cities in Asia and Europe and, and all this good stuff God's going to do with you. No, I want you to know what great things you're going to suffer for my name's sake. But what, when you take a man and that man learns how to make the right choices in the midst of suffering, God uses those people. Every person that you see used by God in any significant way has made right choices in the face of suffering. I think of like Heidi Baker in Africa. My goodness, she went there and they had nothing and, uh, you know, they experienced incredible suffering themselves personally and they're living among a people that suffer incredibly. And yet there's about a million of them that now have their names in the Lamb Book of Life because she was willing to go there and overcome the suffering and deal with the suffering in the right way. And so it doesn't matter whether God wants you to be a missionary or whether he wants you to just be a good housewife or a husband or a son or whatever it is. Just learn to make the right choices because uh, the suffering is part of the package. It's part of the package. And, and it's, if we use it right, it helps us become more like Jesus. And What's better than that? You know, that's, God has set everything up in a way that the thing that the devil tries to get you to do, if you do the opposite of it, you become everything that God wants you to be. Just by learning how to say no to the devil. You know, it's, it's not super 
complicated in the concept. The thing that makes it difficult sometimes, though, is just our own flesh, you know. Our flesh will desire something, and I, I know how that feels. And, but we can win this battle. So let's stand together, and let's all just um, have a moment of introspection. I want you to think about what I've shared with you today. I want you to think about, have I been discouraged? Have I felt like maybe God has really not been there for me in any way, or have I not known what to do, or I'm confused, or anything that, and I want you to just, um, if you're willing, if you want to make that choice, tell the Lord, Lord, I'm going to start trusting you completely. Even when I don't understand what's going on in my life right now, I'm going to start trusting you, and I'm going to start believing that you have answers, and whatever those answers are, I will accept. Because some people... Uh, you know, didn't get the answer they wanted. You know, like the, the man that they stoned. Uh, one of the first martyrs of the Christian church. But, you know, God uses everything. He uses everything. And if you trust him, then you don't let anything hinder you. So I'm going to pray, and you look at your own heart, and you pray to God how you want to pray. Father, we know you have a plan. It's a beautiful plan. We know what the back of the book says. We can read the last few chapters of Revelation, and, and it, it's incredible. It's just our minds can't even conceive of it. And that's there for those that will make the right choices in the face of all the pressures that we encounter in our lives. And, Lord, this body of people right here, they represent all kinds of pressures that have come against them, sickness, financial troubles, uh, relational problems, uh, cars breaking down. The, the list is limitless. But Lord, you are still on the throne and you still want us to look to you and trust you and make the right choices because that's what makes us look like Jesus. May we not get discouraged with our faith. May we still be willing to pray for the neighbor who is sick or to Speak to the one we meet in the marketplace somewhere and share the gospel. Lord, we don't want to stop doing those things. We don't want, that's what the devil's trying to do. He's trying to trick all of us into being discouraged so that we will not be a light. We are to be light set on a hill. And if we learn how to make right choices, you can't stop the shine. The shine comes. It, it, it is unstoppable when a person is making right choices before God and loving him and serving him. Their light will shine. And Lord, we all want to be shining lights. We want this place to be full of people that are singing and worshiping and glorifying you and living their lives according to your glory and your honor. So Lord, in, just encounter us all today like you did Apostle Paul on that road and make suffering just something that we don't even think about anymore. We just think about you. We just think about loving you, serving you, doing what you want us to do. And Lord, just glorify your people with the nature and the love and the presence of Jesus, we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless all of you. If uh, anybody wants special prayer, our prayer team can come up and um, you can come up and get some special prayer. We'll be happy to pray for you.